We shall be reading from the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, chapter 5. Daniel 5 and verse 17. The book of Daniel, the book of Daniel. Chapter 5 and verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men, his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see, or hear, or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written, and this is the inscription that was written, Mene Mene Tekel Ufasen, this is interpretation of each word, Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting, Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about sixty-two years old. Amen. Daniel, old now, advanced in years. In the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, who knew him from the beginning, and came to its end. A kingdom which started full of glory, and God used him for his glory, and God called the first king, Nebuchadnezzar, his servant. And when Nebuchadnezzar was under the authority of God, because God gave to him the authority and the power, the great power, to exalt, to humble whoever he pleases, even to preserve life and to kill whoever he wants, as long as this king of the Chaldeans was in the presence of God, then Daniel was glorified. His son preserved this faith of Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar did die. His grandson, he was indifferent, but he knew the things of God. And the fourth in line, the great-great-grandson, reproached the living God. He forgot about everything. And this is my brethren, the way of man and the way of things, unfortunately. A continuous downfall, that's the way of things. When man 
my beloved brethren, doesn't stand where God wants him to stand. But Daniel, stable, immovable, there, there where God wanted him to be. And in the period of his glory and his prosperity and his authority, and in the period of his reproach and his removal from the things of the kingdom. He has seen many things in his life. He started as a slave and a servant in the kingdom. And when he made that simple decision to remain in purity and holiness, God exalted him. He put him right next to Nebuchadnezzar. He glorified him. And Daniel remained faithful to God, immovable. And then, after a while, the glory, the earthly glory of Daniel started to decrease, to decrease. They removed him from the things of the palace. He didn't say, God has abandoned me. He didn't think that God has something against him because he was always with God. But, his authority decreased as the presence of God decreased in the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. But God, my beloved brethren, wants Daniel to be always ready to give a defense. Always ready. He was not affected. And I marvel with Daniel because in what Ever situation in his personal life, in his surroundings he was in, he was not affected at all. His faith towards God wasn't affected at all. He did not complain to God. He always glorified God. He did not wonder. He did not think about it. He had no other thought but one to glorify God. Only one was his thought in his life. How will I glorify God in my life? How will God be glorified in my life? No other thought. And what he cared about was for God to be glorified in his life under any circumstances of the surroundings that he was living in. When he was a first ruler, he glorified God. And when he was a stranger, forgotten he glorified God again but this has a reward that's a servant of God God needs such a man that's how God wants us to be that's how God needs us to be it's like a rock it's calm there's peace you can see the rock in the waters high there's a storm the rock is crashed by the waves. The rock doesn't move. Immovable. Sometimes it's covered by the waves. But it's right there. It doesn't move. It's not like the sand in the sea. The sand always moves. When there's peace, the sea is crystal clear. But when the wind blows, it's blurry. Daniel is such a rock. And once our Lord Jesus Christ, that's what he prophesied about Simon, the son of Jonah. You are a rock. And when the great things would happen in the first apostolic church, you will be a rock, Peter. And when the persecution starts in Jerusalem, you will be a rock, Peter. And when the persecution starts throughout all the world again, you will be a rock, Peter. Stable, immovable, and in peace, and in tribulation, and in the storms, and in the typhoons, you'll be there, immovable, a useful man in the hands of God. It's very nice, my beloved brethren, what I believe God wants to say to us this morning. Many times we feel that of what's going on, we're useless. That's a big mistake. God wants our thoughts to have always towards the future that God will find a way so His glory can be revealed again in my life. 
and when I am in the basement, and when I am in the upper room. And when I'm in joy, and when I'm in sorrow. And when I'm healthy, and when I'm sick. And this God, He wants this. And this God can do it, if man has made a steadfast decision. A steadfast decision. Immovable in faith, immovable in the grace of Christ, and immovable in persecutions, and trials, and sufferings. A servant of God, a maid servant of God. He prays and continues praying. He fasts and he continues fasting. He testifies and he continues testifying. He always waits, and his senses are always exercised to flee from the traps of the devil and to be found ready always so God can be glorified. And now, Belshazzar is a man now. He knows lots of things, and he has made specific decisions. He has despised Nebuchadnezzar, his father. He has despised God. He has created his own rulers, princes. He has created his own surroundings. His wives, my brethren, beloved, be careful of your surroundings. The surroundings which you create. That's how I was found here. You create your surroundings. You choose. You reject. You choose your friends. You. The only people we can't choose are our relatives. We found them. But evil company, it's written, corrupts good habits. Belshazzar has come to a point of great weakness. He has decided to give glory, not to God. And this is very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. He decided not only to give glory, not to God, but something even worse, to approach God. And this is very, very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous for the man of God and for a Christian to give glory somewhere else and not to God. Either to claim things for himself, for his surroundings, for his children, to boast. And my beloved brethren, we have all fallen into this trap. But it's very, very dangerous for you to boast for your children. For you to boast for yourself. For you to boast for your surroundings. For you to boast for your work. And you might not boast out loud, but you might boast inside yourself. But it's just as bad. You who boast, you boast in the Lord. Because when you boast in the Lord, you give glory to Him. Belshazzar fell into a great big trap. And even though he called all his lords and rulers, he asked for the vessels, the holy vessels from the temple of God, in which Nebuchadnezzar transferred so he can keep them safe. God led him to transfer the vessels so he can keep them safe because they will be useful again after they return back. And he started to drink with his concubines and his wives and to glorify false gods. It is where the long-suffering of God finishes. It is there where the long-suffering of God has no continuation. It is there where God says, Stop! I have numbered your kingdom and finished it. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. It is where God comes and intervenes in the hour He is not waiting and the hour He does not know of. And just remember of that wicked and bad servant who said, The Lord is late in coming. And He starts claiming his pleasure and glory for himself, drinking with the drunkards, eating. He chose his surroundings 
and those servants who wanted to remain in the presence of God, he beat them. There, God's long suffering finishes. There, God intervenes decisively and totally. Enough is enough. In an hour, he does not know of. In an hour, he's not waiting for him to come. He takes him and transfers him where he doesn't want to go. And even to destruction. Of course, God uses many ways. He, he will use a way, not so much for the salvation of men, as for his own glory. Until now, he observed Daniel there alone, isolated, praying, glorifying God. And God decided to glorify Daniel. God decided to intervene now, not only to Belshazzar, but also to Daniel. Until now, you were, people said, in the refrigerator. But I'm going to take you out now into the light. Until now, you were there. And I observed you. Now I will bring you where everyone will see you. Because you are trustworthy. Daniel is trustworthy to God. Second claim, the glory of God. Trustworthy. He did not complain. He did not abandon. He did not give up. He didn't lose his patience. He remained faithful until the end. His love did not decrease toward God, his respect toward God, his fear of the Lord, especially his glorification. He never stopped praying three times a day. The living God turned with open windows towards Jerusalem. When Nebuchadnezzar was king and God had visited him, it was easy. But now that Belshazzar is a king, it's not easy. Now, it's a period in which God is reproached. It's not easy. That's a period where the people of God is persecuted. It's not easy. But he remained faithful. And when? There, in the great celebration, God sent his angel. Or it was God himself. We don't know. With his hand he wrote. His decisions, everyone started to tremble and fear. Everyone, except for Daniel. Everyone. Don't forget that once Daniel was among the rulers of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, now he isn't even a doorkeeper. Everyone started to tremble. And everyone knew what might happen and what must happen. They called the astrologers, the soothsayers, no wisdom, no understanding. The result, one woman, the queen, it was probably his mother who wasn't in that celebration. When she saw them all trembling, she said to her son, it was probably her son, or her husband if it was his wife, but historians say it was probably his mother, that there is someone which the Spirit of the Holy God is upon him. It's him that you've heard about. Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar had exalted him, your father. Call him. Now he has humbled himself. Belshazzar, from fear, my beloved brethren. Let's not come to the point to humble ourselves by fear. Let's humble ourselves for the glory of God. He humbled himself from fear. Are you that man? Who can interpret these writings? And Daniel, ready for a defense, always humble, but always with the truth in his mouth, it is I. But let me tell you, not who I am, but who you are. Let me tell you who you are. It's what I never want in my life for God to tell me. Come, let me tell you who you are. 
Even though you knew what happened to your father, Nebuchadnezzar, that I gave him all the power and the authority, and when he was full of pride, and he hardened his heart and his spirit, he was found in exile from me, from God. Daniel was in exile from people. And that doesn't mean a thing. God always had Daniel in his arms. Seven years, like a beast, Nebuchadnezzar lived until he understood that God is the Lord of all kingdoms on earth. He repented, he returned, and God restored his kingdom to him. And even though you knew, Belshazzar, you did what you shouldn't have done, ever. You didn't give the glory to the one true God. In which he holds your breath in his hands and owns all your ways. This is a revelation who Daniel has, but Belshazzar never knew. God holds your breath in his hands, and the issues of your life are again in the hands of God. And instead of you glorifying him, who glory belongs to you, you glorify other things, other gods. And that's why the decision has been made and it's unchangeable. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. You know what that means, my brethren? For God to put a full stop somewhere, it's finished. It's finished! Do you understand it? It's finished. You're finished. Even though in Christ Jesus our life doesn't finish. On the contrary, it is outstretched. Apostle Paul says, I forget all that's behind me. I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Because I want to receive the prize of the upward call. And God says, now Trim, it's finished. It's finished. And all this, it's finished, comes from his superficiality. He gave the glory to his opinions, his decisions, his thoughts, and to other gods. And now that it's finished, I weighed you, and you were found wanting. And your kingdom has been divided and given to others. It's finished. You're finished. You know, this finish isn't after a few years, that same night. The same night, the Bible says, the Medes and the Persians entered. And Belshazzar was slain, the king of Chaldeans. That same night. But hadn't he understood a thing? Hadn't he realized? The same night he finished, and the same night Daniel was exalted. My beloved brethren, God makes great changes, great changes, all of a sudden in our lives, from one moment to another. You don't know what day. I was reading today, there in Herod, where he was persecuting so strongly the Church of Christ and he killed James and put Peter into prison. And he realized that Peter was freed, the Bible says, in an appointed day by the Lord. Herod was struck and he was eaten by worms and died in one moment. In one moment, in one moment, the jailed Peter was found freed to continue his work. He was in jail, bound, suffering, but in one moment he was freed. And all these things are, as the Bible says, My son, give me your heart, because from your heart spring all the issues of life. 
It's from your heart. It's a result of your desires, your decisions, your thoughts. In the end, your works and your life. Today, let's ask ourselves. You don't know what's going to happen at noon. You don't know what's going to happen at night. Which day is appointed by the Lord for each one of us? We don't know. And Apostle Paul says, so you can be found steadfast in that wicked day where your work will be tested by fire. One day. One day for the whole world. And if you have built in your life with wood, with grass, and weeds and hay, your work will be burnt. But if you have built in your life with gold, with silver, and with precious stones, your work shall remain standing. In the first circumstance, you will be saved, maybe, maybe, through the fire. In the second circumstance, Christ will be glorified in your life. My time, Christ says, hasn't come yet. It will come. For you. The appointed day will come for you. For all of us, the day of the rapture of the church will come. But your day is always. Always. Every day. How do I build? Where am I at? How do I go on? What am I thinking of? What do I meditate when I'm sleeping? What do I talk about during the day with my wife? All these things God is careful of and is listens to them and is writing a book of remembrance, especially for those who fear the Lord. Today, my beloved brethren, it's our day. Today is our day so we can stand before Jesus. Because the day will come and there will be a day of Jesus and He will make us stand before Him. Today, it's our day. Let's stand before Jesus humbly. And let's say, Lord, how do you see me? Not, Lord, how do I see myself? I see myself very well. I'm very good. I'm very pleased with myself. But Herod was also, and Belshazzar was also pleased with himself. And it doesn't matter at all how I see myself and how I see you. What does matter is today, let's say, Lord God, how do you see me? How do you see me, Lord? Am I like Daniel? Or am I like Belshazzar? And of course, I'm not praising gods of silver and gold, but am I praising and glorifying my children? Let me say something else, even worse, even more dangerous. Am I glorifying the gifts of the Holy Spirit which you have given unto me and they are unchangeable? Am I glorifying the ministries which have been given and they are unchangeable? If they are. Because ministries are not. How do you see me, God? How do you see me? You who examines hearts and kidneys. How do you see me, Lord? If the day of the Lord comes, or the evil day comes for me tomorrow, the appointed day, how will you find me? Will you say, it's finished, you're finished? And you say, Lord, for me, go on, I'm with you, my child. My beloved brethren, our souls are always in danger. Let's not neglect to always stand before God. Just in case our hearts justifies us and we are found justified. Just in case our logic takes us away and we are found isolated and far, far from the will of God. This is the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. My God, I'm afraid. 
Is my heart like your heart? My God, I'm afraid. Is my soul willing to do your will? Lord, I'm afraid. Is my spirit lowly in your presence? Because, my beloved brethren, our hearts are deceitful above all things. The Word of God assures us, and desperately wicked. Deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. But it says, even something more. Apostle Paul says, even if my conscience doesn't rebuke me, this doesn't justify me. Because, someone else judges me. And very, very easily my heart can be pleased with myself and my conscience might justify me. And I don't understand a thing. I haven't understood that I'm far, far from the will of God. Far, far from God's favour. Because the favour of God, my brethren, doesn't depend on how. You are exalted in this life like Daniel was in the beginning with Nebuchadnezzar because God's favour was with him to the end when King was Belshazzar. The favour of God is in our personal life, in my personal relationship with God. What is your personal relationship with God? What is it? How is it? How much do you read? How much do you pray? How does God speak to you? How do you speak to God? How do you stand before Him? What is your work? Because a tree is seen if it's good by its fruit. What is your fruit? Look, try and find your fruit. What's it like? Have you got love for everyone? Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Have you got fruit from your lips? Because you confess the name of Jesus. Wherever you go, does the presence of God go with you? Your words, are they like words of God? Your soul, where is it pleased? Where is it happy in the presence of God? If things are like that in your life, when that day will come, you'll be found before a surprise. A tragic surprise. God will put a full stop. You're finished. You know what that means? You're finished. You're finished. That's it. May God keep us safe. Because when God says, you're finished, then, my beloved brethren, no one can continue.